We're going to take a look at the idea of electrical current. Okay, current. And I'm going to make some analogies today that might help you. So you might want to write them down as I say them. Okay? Might help you understand what is going on here. So we're going to do three things first. We're going to take a look at the general properties of current. We're going to discuss the speed of the what are called charge carrier versus the speed of the electric field. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we're going to differentiate between direct and alternating current. You've seen this before on devices. You'll see an AC current or a DC current. One is direct, one is alternating, and there's a difference between the two. And we'll go into the general ideas, okay, as to what they are. So we're again, we're on 19.1. So remember from last class, we did 18.1 the last class. Okay, so we should, in your notes, for this upcoming test after break, you're going to have the end of 17.2, you get all of 17.3, all of 18.1 and all of 19.1. Those are the sections. That's why it's only going to be like a 50 pointer. They are. I put them up last night. So, over break, guys, when you want to work in your problem set, which you'll have to do, obviously, you'll see that you already have stuff from 17.2, 3, and 18.1. That's the stuff I gave you photocopy. And the 19.1 portion is already on Moodle. Okay, if you want to check there today at any point. Remember, what, what did your problem set do? Yeah, the day you get back from break, okay? The day you get back from break. Okay, read in, in letters at the top. Do not be late with that. Make sure it's due to here the day you get back. The reason being is because it's going to count as part of your third quarter grade, and those grades are due four days later. So I can't have you handing in uh, late work for that, like, you know, three, four, or five days late for that, or else you're going to get a zero for the quarter, and it's going to really affect your grade. So even if you're not here on the day you get back from break, what should you do? Yeah, scan an email at least. At least get it into me so it can start be becoming graded and so you don't get any points off for being late. And then you can bring in the you know original copy the next day or whatever. But make sure you get it in the day after break. And you should be done with almost all of it by now. 17, 2, and 3, you had a lot of time to work on the other day. You had two periods now. Okay, those should definitely be done. 18, 1 may be in the works, and the 19, 1 we're working on today. But this section you're going to see is quite easy. It's just an introductory to electric circuits. We're talking about current. Let's take a look and define current first. We're going to define it at the, as the rate at which electric charges move through a given area. The rate. What do you think of when you hear rate? What do you think of when you hear rate? Distance and time. Yeah, distance and time, really. Good. Whenever you hear rate, you think of a rate as in something per unit time. So what this is, is the idea of how much charge is moving through a given area, the area of the actual... Um, of the actual wiring, rather, and over what time period is really what's going on here. Okay? So here's the analogy I want you to think about. And please write this down in big letters. Think of water flowing through a pipe. Think of water flowing through a pipe. Whenever you think of current, it will really help you a lot make the connection as to what is happening. So imagine you have this pipe, and instead of water suddenly, now there are tons and tons of electrons in there. Okay? So every water droplet that you would have seen inside the pipe is now an electron to the point where it's overflowing with an abundance of electrons. Okay, there are so many electrons, it's tough for them to move. And there's some resistance in the pipe as well. So when water flows through a pipe, along the walls, the water gets slowed down. It's called a viscous force. And we didn't go into fluid mechanics here. And it's viscosity. Yeah. We didn't go into fluid mechanics. It's not on your SAT subject test. But I might record an extra video in case you're interested in it. It's a very interesting topic. But the idea behind this uh, an incompressible fluid inside of a pipe will feel some sort of resistance along the walls. So there's going to be some sort of frictional force involved. The same thing really happens with electrons here going through a circuit. They're going to get resisted at some point in time, and we're going to talk about something called a resistor, which controls the flow of electrons. Okay, and we'll talk about that in one of our later sections, and we'll definitely get to that. But the idea here is think of the analogy as water flowing through a pipe. Okay, water flowing through a pipe. Now, we have to go over what the actual uh, formula is for this. So the formula we're going to use is simply going to be I, which stands for current, capital I is current, equals delta Q over delta T. And think about it and just look at the definition and look at the equation and they make sense. Delta Q is the change in charge, <coughs> delta T is the change in time, so the rate at which charges move. This part right here, the rate at which charges move, is simply the exact same thing as the definition itself. Okay, that is identical to what you see here. The rate, which is delta T, 
at which charges, which is Q, move. So the change in charge over the change in time. So if 35 coulombs of charge move through a certain cross-sectional area in 10 seconds, you just take 35 divided by 10, you get a current of 3.5. Anybody know what the units are for current in electrical circuits? You've seen it before probably. You've seen it before on like appliances. Not volts, that's voltage. Not watts, that's power. It's energy. It's not something you've heard before in this class, so let's put it that way, it's new. And you might have seen it on appliances before. The units of current. AMH. What is it? AMH. Which stands for? MDMA. Sorry, did Google give you that answer? Or? Yeah. That, that, that's the right one. Is that what you're saying or no? AMH. What does AMH stand for? I don't know. Uh, the, the unit is like amp. Yeah. Oh, amp. Yeah. So you say amps? Amps. Yeah. Okay. The unit is actual ampere. So, yeah, you've seen this in any electrical device, you'll see amps. So, it could be a guitar, it could be any example you want to think of. So, capital A is the units, capital A, and that stands for ampere, A-M-P-E-R-E, -E, which is abbreviated, you'll hear me say amps, A-M-P-S. I'll put that in quotes. Okay? So, if something has 45 amps flowing through it, it means the current, the current, is 45 coulombs per second. Okay, coulombs per second. Remember your units, break them down if you ever need to. Delta Q is coulombs, delta T is second, so an amp is really a coulomb per second. Just like we have meters per second with velocity, this is coulombs per second, but they were given a name as amps or amperes. Um, many applications of this. One that I thought I'd mention outside of, you know, appliances, computers, machinery, your, your body actually since it has current that runs through it. And there is electrical current that's running through your body every second. Anytime you want to make any motion with a muscle, every time your heart beats, there's literally an electrical circuit that is sent from your brain through your spinal cord telling your heart to compress and to, you know, expand as it's, pul as it's pulsating. If you want to lift your arm, think about it. The time it takes for your brain to tell my hand right here to move up has got to be on a, you know, on an order of like micro and milliseconds and nanoseconds, or else it wouldn't make sense, right? Think about it. If you touch a hot stove, what do you do automatically? You pull your hand away, right? But you ever hear about people that are doing like LSD and drugs that really mess up your mind? When they touch like a hot surface and they don't move it right away, and they'll literally burn their hand for a while? This is not like a false thing. What some of those drugs do is they lower your response time. So the electrical circuit that would normally go through your body is not happening anymore. And they'll sit there and like, there are stories about people that have done some crazy stuff on different types of drugs that have killed themselves. And a lot of it goes back to the idea that there's an electrical circuit running through your body. And that electrical circuit is like a safety hazard for you. It's preventing you from hurting yourself. That's why if, like, if you ever, I mean, even if you like slam your finger in a door, you'll naturally pull it away, right? You're not going to leave it there. Like, oh, that hurts. Ow. You're, you're going to pull your hand away. Okay, it makes sense because the electrical circuit tells you, move my hand away. It's an automatic response as you grow up. There's an issue of workaholics. Workaholics? Yeah, no. Sure. I've heard it though. Uh, CBS? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Not they do you. like acids okay. and then and then the counter turns into jello. And the counter turns into jello? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When they're trying yeah. to the store. Wow, that has wow. a system. Wow. <laughs> that is. Wait, that's because of the electricity. Is there a disease that people lose that? And so they have like the, they end up losing a lot of limbs in their body because they can't tell when they are hurt oh, or like, like, um, like leprosy lepros lepros or something like that. And it's not leprosy, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. When they don't Wait, have yeah it is. Leprosy is when you can't when you can't you have like no nerve. You can't yeah, feel anything. I think that's what. No, I just that's that is, that's leprosy. Yeah. Yeah. A positive. No, it's uh, when they don't have a pain. They don't. Yeah, I think it's yeah, about pain though. You have a pain receptor. Oh, maybe leprosy does, but I think there's something else. Not leprosy. It's just talkers. They're more severe. Monks, there's certain monks that can go into such a deep meditation that they can't allow their body not to feel pain. Nice section, Enda. No, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's all mind over matter kind of thing. But again, the, the physics behind it is that the electrical circuit is actually kind of body. interesting how they're defined physically. Yeah. Nerve damage oh, yeah. and muscle weakness. That's yeah. interesting. That's that's really really pain. I've been practicing that for the past four years. I'm not even kidding. The, the ultimate goal for a lot of people that are like monks and stuff is to eventually like levitate. You know that, right? That's what their that's what their goal is, which it would be that's really defined. Oh, uh, there's actual there's actual monks that I've met that uh, that can do that. Yeah. Yeah. They just don't tell people how to. Oh, I see. All right, you don't have to write all this, but let's talk about this. So, first, remember conductors 
Okay, conductors, they're really looking at the flow of electrons through them. But it is possible for protons to flow as well, which makes it a little bit difficult to talk about electric circuits. So electric circuits, there is an electron flow flowing through the circuitry. So when the light bulb lights up, there's electrons flowing through, and they hit the light bulb, which acts as a resistor and gives off that energy in the form of light. But there are ways to make protons travel also. So negative charge can flow or positive charge can flow. Okay? And one of the examples, I put parentheses there, is a particle accelerator. A particle accelerator can uh, accelerate protons through its path and cause them to actually collide, and that's where they have things like um, fission. Now, a combination, okay, a combination of this can also occur of positive and negative flow, and that's when we look at things like gases and dissolved salts. So if you look at a liquid that has salts dissolved in it, and some of you might have done this before, actually, if you, you can make what's called a salt bridge, and maybe if you had a, you know, a, a middle school that did a lot of projects in science, you might have done this, maybe not, but the idea is that if you have salts dissolved, listen, if you have salt dissolved in the water, they become, uh, the water becomes charged with ions, and that becomes what's called an electrolyte. And what happens is, because there's an imbalance of charge, there will be a flow from one liquid to the other. So you can have flow that's going in both directions in that case. So there's some positive flow moving, some negative flow moving, actually. So we've talked about the idea that any of these can happen. But traditionally, okay, traditionally we say that the direction of current is opposite the movement of the negative charges. That's the key here. And you'll see this in the diagram. So take a look at all the negative, uh, all the electrons here. They are naturally moving to the left. Say there's a positive pole at the end here. Okay, but we call the flow opposite the direction of the negative charge. And it's just a traditional thing. It really doesn't matter, but you're going to see this over and over in all your textbooks and anything that you ever study in physics, that the flow of current is opposite the movement of the negative charges. Okay, Sasha. Oh, right, just like a question. Sure. Oh. Do you know what happens to all the electricity that isn't used? Because I mean, because like they don't store any electricity they make. So well, those are just like do they always just grounded. Like, so it can be grounded or it can be stored in capacitors. You know what a capacitor is, right? They don't. They don't really have any big large capacitor actors. Though. <laughs> what? They don't really have any large scale capacitors. So, for example, like what do you mean? Like in your house, if you? I mean, like like from like the power plants. Like, um, I don't know, that's a good question. They're, they're generating electricity using generators, obviously, in some sort of... I mean, some of them might use a solar panel and stuff, but... At some points they use it, some points they don't. So what happens to it all maybe gets dissipated and it gets grounded, yeah. It's a good question, I'm not sure. Like what a power plant does with its surplus energy, pretty much, right? I mean, ideally they would hope to minimize, and that's using calculus, actually, the the waste. So they come up with some sort of operation so that they have an idea of what they're doing. So there's definitely somebody there that's optimizing the scenario, but there's probably some energy that is lost. I don't know. It's a really good question. I'm not sure. Maybe you can look it up and tell us. Well, they're, they're starting to make batteries. Like that Wait, what's that a battery? So if they're well, using they have excess energy, if they have really large, heavy, uh, like, rotating discs in, uh, in vacuums. Start ready, guys. So then, like, it, um, so they can store energy that way. Interesting. But they don't have it yet. So right now, they're just, they have energy out of that. How many times the keyboard throw it out? Yeah. Let me look it up, maybe. I can scratch it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Guys, write this example. Let's go. No, no. Okay. The slides are also up and they're blank. Mm -hmm. There's no double scroll on top of it or anything? Uh, I mean, I, again, what I do, I do, I do, I do on my computer, and I save it to my Dropbox. And then it uses a program they're using and over the old drive because it saves the actual PDF. So I don't know, maybe troubleshoot doing that. I know, sorry, man. I know you're saying that you can't scroll on the view, right? Yeah, yeah. It just pulls the first page off. I don't know, I think Max found something or some way to do it. What are you even using for your iPad? For what? Remember for the TDS Max? Can you use a program? <laughs> that was it. That enables you to download the whole PDF because what Dan is doing is he's downloading it to a program 
but it's only, you know how in Moodle it only shows the first page of the PDF yeah, until you scroll? So he can only get the first page of the PDF, he can't get the whole document. That's, that's, that's where the mistake is. Olivia doesn't Olivia have So maybe give him a word of advice. Olivia doesn't have that. Your messages are not in the bubble when I go into Moodle. It'll be like four new messages. Every hour. Four? Yeah. You can't ignore it. I've been doing it like 10 seconds. I can use it all up no matter what time of day it is. Am I the only teacher that ever messages? Yes. It's like your instant messages. No one Moodle chats in the email. I'm thankful that email. Yeah, I'm trying to think about it because you know what? You replied to my message and it came through Moodle and it won't get off my screen either on the phone, right? It's like Fernando has sent you a message and it won't get I even because I logged into Moodle every single time. Mr. How Mark How a new message. So I clicked that as a like, you want to get nine hundred messages. Alright, let me ask Mr. Retro. Let's see. I'll, I'll ask it's him. Maybe, maybe there's a way to do it. It's a thing. Yeah, but uh, there's no distribution list for your class to email to. Class of 2014. Yeah, that's the whole juniors. Yeah, so? I'm so just like, saying I'm not for non honors. And then district, this district guard for not in my class. This is not for my business. No, that's, then, then everybody that's not in my class is getting an email. This, this I don't want them all to get an email. I'll just put on the subject bar for a regular I'll ask Mr. Retro. I'll ask him. Yeah, there probably is a way to get a class distribution list for this. Uh, class. Physics class, hashtag not on the Okay, okay. Hashtag So, hashtag for the student. Now, for this problem, it says, and think about this, guys. This is, this is logical, this statement here. First, for a standard refrigerator, when you start it up, like when you turn it on initially, it's going to pull more, it's going to draw more electricity into it. Okay, but once it gets running at its optimal state, once the refrigerator cools off enough and it's running for a while, uh, the amount of current that's running through it, the amount of current that's running through it will be reduced by a large factor. And you see that factor of reduction is five here. It starts with around 15 amps, and once it's running, it's only pulling three amps of current through it. Now, for a 10-second time interval, how much more charge passes a given point in the circuit? During the startup mode than during the run during the running mode. Old. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. Let's write down what we know. First, during the running mode, the current, so I1, is 15 amps. During the startup mode, again, it's I1 is 15 amps. During the running mode, shh, listen guys. The current is reduced significantly. There's much less electricity needed to keep it cool. By the way, that's why you know. And I, I know this because I my dad owns a deli and I work there. If you have a refrigerator and you want your refrigerator to use as less as little energy as possible, you really want to pack it out actually as most possible. Because what it's <coughs> what a refrigerator is doing is it's keeping what's inside of it cool and it's removing the hot air. So if you can fill it completely with cold items, there's less air for it to actually remove. Okay? There's less fluid for it to flow through it. Um, now the time interval is the same. So delta T is 10 seconds either way. So we're looking at a 10 second time period when it starts up, and then we're looking at a 10 second time period when it's been running for a while already, and we're going to compare the amount of charge each of those draws. So let's start with our formula, please. Now, solve for delta Q by moving delta T up, please. Again, solve for delta Q by multiplying both sides by delta T or just moving it up. Okay, so what we can do is we can find the amount of charge that passes during the startup mode by using the current in the startup mode and the time period of 10 seconds. Then we can find the amount of charge, the amount of charge during the running mode by using the three amps or the running current and multiplying by another 10 seconds because it's still a 10 second time period. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to realize that what we're trying to find really is this. The difference, right? The problem said how much more charge goes through the circuit or passes through a given point during the startup mode versus the running mode. Well, the startup mode is, well, in this case, if we look at our formula, here I should switch the order of these because I wrote them the other way. doesn't matter, though. Okay? If you wrote them as delta Q1 and Q2, you could have them the other way. Okay? But the idea is that we have the startup mode, which is drawing 15 amps over a 10-period time second, minus the running mode, which is drawing 3 amps over a 10-period time second. 
So if you want to find them separately, find them separately or just use this formula. Why don't okay? you just use delta i? Want to use delta i? That works too, and that's what I'm going to show you here. So you could say that this is, again, i1 delta t minus i2 delta t. Delta t. Yeah, okay, now i1 minus i2 is really delta i, so that's fine for an if you want to think of it that way. Okay, or you can just simply do this. By factoring out a delta t. If you got confused at this point here, or if this is getting a little bit weird at this point, just plug in each of the scenarios here and then subtract the two. Okay? So you can do it up here by going like this. And you can find delta q2 is i2 delta t. Okay? What was i2? i2 was 3, right? And i1 was 15? So this is 15 times 10 up here for the amount of charge during startup mode. During running mode, it's just 3 times 10. <coughs> so we have 150 minus 30, really. Okay, 150 minus 30. So you're going to have a difference in charge of 120 coulombs. It's the same answer we'll get down here. Okay. Either way, it's 120. So the idea here is all I wanted to do was practice finding the charge that passes a given point due to a certain current, but do it twice. Do it for startup mode, where it's running at 15 amps. Let me move this over so you can see better. Do it at startup mode, where it's running at 15 amps. For a period of 10 seconds, you'll get 150 coulombs of charge. Then during the running mode, where it's running at 3 amps for 10 seconds, it'll be 30 coulombs of charge. And the question was, what is the difference in the amount of charge used in each of these scenarios? It's just the difference between the two. 150 minus 30 gives us 120, or you could have done it this way that I was showing you again. Is it possible to figure out each charge? You could have done it this way as an alternate solution. Is it possible to figure out each charge? That's what I was showing above here, so look. Then 150 minus 30 gives you the 120 that's down here. Okay, so you could find the amount of charge during startup mode, the amount of charge during running mode, subtract the two and get the 120, or you can write it this way. Whatever is easier. I'm just showing that this is what we're doing. We're finding the difference in charges, replacing the formulas, <coughs> factoring out a delta T, and then plugging in. But the above way works the same. It's identical. Max. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not meant to be tough math at all, guys. The only tough part you're going to get to, an example in your problem set and in your homework example says that electrons flow through. It says, like, you know, a certain amount of electrons flow through. So if you want to know how much charge is flowing, you need to remember that the electron charge is, yes, go ahead, 1.6 times 10 of the? Negative 19. Yeah, negative 19 coulombs. Good memory, Jeff. Jeff. Okay. So again, say there are a thousand electrons flowing through a circuit over a certain given time period, you want to find the current, the charge on an electron needs to be multiplied by a thousand to see how much charge is flowing through, okay, see how much charge is flowing through, and then divide it by the time period to find that current, okay, to find that current. Let's take a look at this next part. So we're going to talk about something called drift velocity. Write down the definition, please, and then we'll talk about the rest. It was, please write. Shh, please write down the definition. Okay, just the definition at the top. So we have the net velocity, the net velocity, net meaning overall, of a charge carrier moving in an electric field. The net velocity of a charge carrier moving in an electric field. And I wish we were in 401 today, because I had a, a good example, but the stuff's up there. But I can explain it to you to think about. It might be easy. So, first, let's talk about what's happening here. So, when a switch is turned on, okay, what happens is it establishes an electric field. Okay, the electric field is what causes the electrons to go in motion. And think about an electric field. The electric fields that we were talking about, you can have uh, a positive point charge or a negative point charge, which either draws toward it or pushes away. So when you turn a light switch on, you're setting up an electric field, which is then causing the electrons to move. Okay? The electric field 
travels almost at the speed of light, but the charges themselves, remember we said, think about those as if it's water, right? And water through a pipe is going to feel some resistance. So the electrons that are flowing are flowing because the metal in the wire is allowing it to because it's a conductor. So those electrons are not only feeling resistance from like, you know, the walls of the conductor and the wiring, but they're also bouncing off of the atoms in the metal. So there are tons of collisions going on. So see this diagram on the right? This is actually what you would see if you were able to map the trajectory of an electron through a circuit. Okay, so in the middle of the wire, it's going through the wire, but it's hitting into all these atoms. It's bouncing back and forth. So there's tons of collisions. So they're vibrating with these metal atoms. They're hitting them, and it's slowing them down. So the actual speed, and this is kind of interesting to think about, and I wrote this down for that reason. The, the actual speed of electrons is quite slow. It's, ready, 0. 0.0003 meters per second. Okay, so it's going very, very slow. So you might think to yourself, well, that doesn't make sense though, because when I turn the light switch on, I see the light instantly, right? But what it's doing is it's carrying the signal, really. It's carrying the signal to the other electrons in the circuit. So, for example, here's, here's your analogy for this one to make, you, make, you, make it easier to think about. Imagine you take a ruler, Okay, like a normal ruler. Now, have you ever seen the plastic rulers that have like a, yeah. almost like a slot in the middle yeah. down the whole way of the ruler? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw what I'm saying here. So imagine you have a normal ruler, okay? And there's like a little cave like carved out of here, a little channel, okay? And you put your pencil, you put your pencil in that channel sometimes if it's sitting on your desk. So there's a ruler with like a little half pipe Kind of carved out of the oh, wood. Yeah. All right, now, imagine, listen, imagine if you took the ruler and you took a normal marble, okay, and you put enough marbles on the ruler so that the whole groove was filled with marbles. So there's marbles sitting everywhere on this ruler, okay? Now, imagine, it's an analogy, imagine if you took one marble. Guys, look up here, please. Come on, stop talking. Look up here. Imagine if you took one marble and you decided to try and put the marble on one end of it. What would happen to the marble at the other end of the other side? It would fall off, right? So if you took one marble and you int introduced it into one end, it would push the marble off the other end. That's what's happening, really, with the electrons. It's like as if you're, you know, you know when you like, take a slinky or we, you look at vibrations, we talk about longitudinal vibrations, how the molecules bounce into each other and cause them to vibrate? That's what's happening here. So if one electron is introduced over here in the circuit or is caused to move, it's going to push all the other ones down the line so the signal is automatically felt at the other end. So when I put that one marble in over here on the right side, the marble on the left-hand side is going to fall off. That's like the signal that's passing that quick. So even though the marbles aren't moving quickly, the signal is sent to the other end of the circuit. Okay, it is sent to the other end. That's like Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep, exactly, Jeff. Okay, Stash, you had a hand. Still a question or are you good? Okay. All right, let's talk about the next thing. So again, that was drift velocity. Just know that it's less than the electric field velocity by a significant amount because it's the charge, okay, the electrons flow. So what we're going to do now is look at sources of current, okay, where current comes from. We're going to talk at two things. We're going to look at two examples. First are batteries. Now, what batteries do, and this is, a, this is an example. Remember I talked about a salt bridge earlier with ions? This is what is here, a simple battery. But what a battery is, it's the conversion of chemical energy to electrical energy. The simplest example, go ahead and try it with a lemon. Okay, take a lemon. It actually does work. Okay. Take a lemon. It's not gonna listen, it's not gonna hurt you. It will not hurt you. Okay? Take a lemon. Squeeze it. Listen, come on. Take a lemon, take a wire, two pieces. If you were to put two pieces of the wire into the lemon, and then say you took those lemons and touched them to your tongue, you'll feel a little bit of like a, a bitter taste. You'll feel the current flowing through your tongue. So there's salt in your saliva, which makes your saliva electrolyte, electrolytic. You can carry current. Okay? So you'll feel that current flow through you, and it also goes through the lemon, which has chemical energy. 
When I was a freshman at Villanova, one of our things we had to do was design a car that ran on lemon juice. Okay, and we did. It was a small car, only about this big, but it was able to go through a maze. <coughs> through a maze, and we used light sensors for it to turn and stuff. So we did a bunch of computer engineering, a bunch of electrical engineering. We did some chemical engineering with the lemon. Then we eventually had to des uh, design a bridge that could carry it over. That was a little civil engineering. And then the torque on the car was mechanical. So it was an interdisciplinary project. And one of the things was to use lemon juice as your power source. So this example here in this diagram, <coughs> all it's showing you is when you have two different poles, a negative and a positive charge, <coughs> there's going to be flow. Okay, now, the next pole is a generator. Got that hill slope. The generator is very different. Okay, a generator has energy that is produced, and traditional generators like hand crank generators, okay, or like a dam, a dam uses water flowing through it to generate energy as it, ch as it turns some sort of a magnetic field. So, what you have here is a magnet, Okay, and this is a very simple and crude example here. You can see much more elaborate ones online. But it's a magnet, okay, with some sort of person turning the crank, which creates the electrical field here, which generates energy to run the light bulb. Okay, so this is a hand crank generator. And if you go online, you can actually buy manually produced generators. So you can buy generators that if one day, say there's, you know, some reason we lose all electricity some point in the world, you can actually generate your own electricity by sitting there and cranking the energy to produce light. <laughs> now, it won't sustain it well, and it won't be a good source, and it'll be very inefficient, but it would actually work. Okay? It would actually work. There's a lot more to generators. We're going to talk more about them later in the chapters, okay? Last thing we need to talk about today. Last thing here. The difference between DC and AC currents. So... They are self-explanatory based on their names. Direct current versus alternating. Look at, the, look at the first, look at the graphs. A direct current just means it is, what's the word? Direct when something doesn't change? It is linear for sure, but when it doesn't change. Constant, good candy. There's a constant current, whereas the current on an alternating current is switching back and forth actually. And the issue here is this, for a direct current, the battery terminals are fixed. So imagine if you looked at the current flowing between the terminals on a 9-volt battery. It would go from one end to the other. Okay? Always. But with an alternating current, we have an example where the poles, okay, or the terminals are constantly changing signs. So the motion is constantly changing. And this is actually alternating current is what you see in your house. But you don't notice it. You don't notice the lights flickering. You don't notice the change and you don't notice that variation. Anybody know why? Why don't you see the lights flickering right now? Because they sure are. If our eyes were keen enough, we'd be able to see it. Yes, exactly. It's faster than what your eyes can perceive. It's, a, it's at a rate of traditionally 60 hertz, which means that the current is fluctuating 60 times every second. Every single second. If the current, if the vibrations or the oscillations were to slow down enough, you would actually see the lights flickering but you don't see them flickering, okay? The United States has a standard of 60 hertz it has to maintain. So the electricity that you see is always above 60 hertz. Okay, Jack and Fernando. I, uh, yeah, like I watch a lot of car videos online, and uh, all, the, like, Listen. all the lights, uh, the lights always flicker. Because like, but the camera, the camera, the sh usually like if it's a nice camera, the shutter speed or whatever, like, it's or, faster than what, yeah, it's, it's more than 60 frames per second. Yeah, yes. especially if it's in slow motion. Sure. He's exactly right. When the camera's higher than 60 frames per second, it's able to see faster than the actual frequency so it can pick up on that camera. <coughs> good point, Jack. Really good point. Fernando. You good? Jeff. Uh, who was it who told me in this class, Matt? Someone told me that there's a, a guy in Germany or someone who created the light bulb. A guy in Germany? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, somebody who created the light bulb. Albert Einstein. Thomas Edison. That's what I'm saying. light bulb that never <laughs> ran out and the government bought it out and destroyed it. So well, a light bulb doesn't have energy. A light bulb is actually a resistor. It slows down the flow of electrons and causes them to almost stay in the, elect so the light bulb for a minute, so which causes it to light up. It's a fat little bit of it, 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 it might have been something else, though. You might, might be making a good point, but maybe it's not the light bulb, Jeff. Maybe it's like a... Yeah, yeah. The, maybe it's some sort of... some filling. type of way, and uh, the government bought it out, so... So that they don't have to worry the about the electrical companies yeah. losing their, yeah. their stock in, the, yeah. in their place in the world. And this guy would become a billionaire. I don't know. 
I don't know. I'd love to see it. If you, if Tyson, if you can find that the link for it. Me. Yeah, Google and send it to me, please. Guys, over break. Listen, well, I'll have you tomorrow, so I'm sorry. But tonight, work on this homework. But remember, over break, to work on your problem set. Okay, some of these problems here from this homework are going to talk about, say, like thousands of electrons flowing. You need to practice this tonight. So tomorrow in class, if you have a question, you can ask. Please, okay? It's over break. You're going to have a problem similar to your homework ones tonight. Make sure you practice this tonight. Okay, make sure you practice this one tonight. Ow. What? I just...